Okay, this is the promised uh, talk on ages, and it's been referred to a few times. So I'm supposed to be, uh, let's see, the expert, as Travis said, uh, the realist, I think, as somebody else said, and uh, I, I forget what else, but I'm kind of a known, well-known skeptic in the area of how well we can know this uh, very important parameter. So uh, that's my perspective. Uh, the previous couple of speakers introduced uh, part of my motivational material quite well, so I'll, I'll breeze through this. But uh, we know very precisely, let's get rid of this. Uh, we know very precisely uh, 4.56 dot 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 uh, billion years ago that our solar system looked something like uh, this schematic of a swirling uh, disk of dust and gas, out of which, uh, through a lot of fascinating physics, we formed a fairly ordered solar system. Uh, with our inner rocky outer gas giant planets and planetary science uh, is now uh, studying the dynamics of the solar system, the large bodies, the small bodies, the uh, atmospheres, uh, and so on, the tectonics, volcanism, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but we don't have a complete understanding of this system. And uh, we just heard some nice talks about atmosphere evolution models. And uh, you know, while we might produce Jupiter fairly well, uh, we still have uh, some issues in standard models uh, with some of the planets, which I understand uh, can, be, can be fixed or partially remedied through uh, some uh, mixing in the atmospheres. Uh, so again, we don't, still don't have a perfect understanding of our own solar system. Now, this plot, which again has been uh, fairly uh, well introduced so far, so I don't have to spend so much time on it, uh, illustrates that for these uh, uh, planetary and brown dwarf objects, they basically cool uh, and, and fade uh, as they age, whereas the stars reach a plateau due to nuclear burning and stay at relative, uh, relatively constant luminosity. So this is the motivation for looking at uh, younger objects where the low mass uh, companions, brown dwarfs, planets are, are brighter. And uh, in particular, uh, the, the planets are fading faster than the stars and, and brown dwarfs initially. And so there's a contrast issue that not only are the planets intrinsically brighter, but the contrast between the star and the companion uh, is, is lower. So it's technically a less challenging uh, problem. Um, so uh, again, we heard from uh, the previous speakers about these atmosphere models. And uh, the point that I want to make is, uh, I guess, relative to the previous slide, uh, normally what is done is we don't have a luminosity uh, generally for either of these objects. We have a contrast, so the star and the planet, and usually in a single band or maybe multiple, multiple bands from which we try to assume something about the star uh, and therefore infer something about the companion. Even if you have a spectrum where you might be able to infer a temperature from uh, an atmosphere model, there's a degeneracy between mass and age. So, uh, for uh, a Jupiter mass planet, which I believe is the blue line on this plot, uh, if at, at five billion years, and I believe there's some insulation from the, the sun included uh, here uh, in the optical out through the, the mid-infrared part of the spectrum, uh, if we then make, uh, uh, just look at that one Jupiter mass planet as a function of age, uh, uh, you can see some similarities in the near-infrared spectrum for a young one Jupiter mass planet and uh, a much more massive five billion year planet. So uh, photometry and spectroscopy uh, alone are not, are not enough. Uh, you really need to know something about the age of the star. And so some questions that motivate uh, this uh, are uh, the evolution of debris disks, uh, uh, sorry, the detection of debris disks and properties of spatially resolved uh, systems like this. How do they fit in the context of, of uh, stars of similar mass and age and, and the debris disk properties? Uh, uh, of them, uh, how does how do debris disks evolve as a function? Uh, uh, this is total luminosity, but again, there might be uh, temperatures or uh, uh, different uh, spatial profiles, uh, radial profiles of the density in those disks. These are uh, again motivational questions. How old uh, are the stars with these companions? How well uh, can we constrain these ages? And uh, most fundamentally, are these faint companions? Uh, planets or, or brown dwarfs. And again, the age uh, of the star is critical um, to uh, inferring the mass of the companion. And then, uh, the, uh, in addition to detecting and studying individual objects, we want to understand the distributions. And this was referred to earlier. Uh, what are the, uh, the power uh, distributions in 
mass, the mass distribution, and the semi-major axis distribution. And this is uh, the data, the few data points we have uh, relative to some uh, models of, uh, you know, trying to fit different models of the mass and separation distributions. So the assumption in all of this is that the object we're studying, the disk or the uh, faint object, planet or brown dwarf, has an age very similar to the age of the star. And so what is the age of the star? So unlike uh, many of the systems that you've uh, heard about, studied, say, with Kepler, uh, or before that, previous decades of stellar astronomy from the ground, where you have, say, an eclipsing binary system, or best yet, a double line eclipsing binary system, where you can infer uh, the velocities, the radii, uh, and infer masses fundamentally from something we trust, like gravity, uh, for age, uh, we don't have that. So again, masses and radii can be determined somewhat fundamentally. Uh, for age, we're stuck with uh, some of these uh, less, uh, more um, uh, uh, things that we can observe that then need to be calibrated to infer an age. And so there are two sets of uh, properties here. One are model-dependent properties, and I'll go through uh, some of these. And then there are empirically uh, calibrated relationships between different observables and uh, usually clusters where we think we know something about the age of the star from these uh, model-dependent techniques. So I'm going to go through uh, uh, some of these. And uh, uh, some of the figures that I'm using here are taken uh, from a couple of review papers. This slide appears at the end as well. So uh, these have been some of my uh, collaborators in various ways on various uh, projects. And uh, each of us has written one review or, or other uh, that's given here. OK, so let's start with the stellar evolution models. And again, we heard about planetary models, atmosphere models, uh, formation and evolution of, of uh, low mass atmospheres. Of course, for stars, this has been going on for many more decades uh, than, than for planets. But it's the same basic physics that you just heard about. And uh, we try to look uh, for the purpose here of directly imaging planets at the youngest stars possible. And so if you're still catching the stars in the pre-main sequence phase, where they're still contracting to the main sequence, haven't yet started hydrogen burning. Uh, again, as we said, the, the planets, the stars are brighter, the planets are brighter, uh, and the contrast is a little more favorable. Uh, and so there are theoretical isochrones in the pre-main sequence. They're uh, you know, reasonably um, straightforward to calculate uh, how we calibrate them to something uh, that we trust in terms of a, a precise and reliable age is, is still currently being debated in that community. But the isochrones are pretty, uh, pretty easy to interpret. As we get onto, uh, close to, onto, or maybe barely off the main sequence, uh, there's a lot of overlap in the isochrones, or sorry, not overlap, but uh, uh, crowding of the isochrones. And so uh, the observational errors have a bigger uh, role to play in the uncertainty in the inferred, in the inferred age. And then also systematics, for example, the composition uh, will systematically uh, shift where these isochrones lie. Uh, for evolved stars, uh, the isochrones, as the star evolves, spread out a little bit. And so uh, again, we're like in the pre-main sequence phase where we can uh, determine fairly well where a star sits relative to some model, uh, but we still uh, are, are working on, the, on the, the fundamental calibration. The issue is when the stars are old and post-main sequence, uh, the prospects for directly imaging companions, the planets are also older and uh, much fainter. And so again, the, the, it requires higher contrast to reach that same mass. So you really want to try to understand the ages at these younger phases. So these are just um, a, a series of isochrones uh, in luminosity and effective temperature space, the standard HR diagram showing the pre-main sequence contraction time for the sun of about 30 million years, which you can calculate from your standard uh, Kelvin Helmholtz uh, uh, you know, intro uh, astro calculation for lower mass stars at that same age, they're still pre-main sequence. So a contraction track looks something like this. Uh, the higher mass stars, of course, uh, reach the main sequence more quickly. And by an age of about 100 million years or so, uh, as would be the case for, say, the Pleiades cluster in the uh, light blue line here, the higher mass stars have started to evolve off the main sequence uh, before the lower mass stars have even, even reached it. And at the low mass, eight, low, low mass end, this contraction in luminosity is about t to the minus 2 thirds. Again, you can drive that uh, somewhat fundamentally. And so you can look at this in a theorist space, or if you apply an atmosphere. Uh, again, this is, a, this is a color magnitude diagram, but the same kind of, of HR diagram. But this relies on an atmosphere, uh, details of the atmosphere uh, for calculating these uh, brightness in different photometric bands. And so you can work in either. Uh, I tend to prefer 
uh, I, I have the philosophy that it's up to the observers to figure out how to transform what we observe into the theoretical place. We should figure out how to do that um, uh, as opposed to the theorists calculating uh, photometric quantities, but that's a, a philosophy not everybody shares. Uh, so then the stars hit the main sequence, and this is the main sequence, the time on the main sequence, a plot from Eric Momajak, time on the main sequence as a function of color or mass of the star. So of course the low mass stars uh, have longer main sequence times than the higher mass stars. And what's interesting, uh, if you look uh, back to that first plot I showed of the cooling curves for the solar system giant planets, uh, this few hundred million years to billion year uh, time range is basically where the stars are uh, sorry, the planets are, are transitioning from that rapid cooling to uh, across that knee where the cooling is slightly shallower with time. And this is one of the reasons uh, that these A-type stars have been uh, somewhat favorably targeted for uh, uh, planet searches because the stars are bright uh, as well as the fact that the planets are still bright. So you're just before that, uh, that leveling off. Okay, and then, uh, so this is just the post-main sequence evolution, as I said, for a, a Pleiades, 100 million year old uh, cluster, the higher mass stars uh, uh, are evolving off the main sequence. And so, uh, you know, stellar evolution for the past many decades, uh, people who study clusters, you know, uh, go out and take observations and try to put stars on these diagrams, figure out the mean ages of clusters basically uh, by using uh, isochrones like this. Now, if you want to actually make an HR diagram for uh, a young star, say a pre-main sequence star, I'm not going to go through this, but it's just in the slides, uh, you know, there's a whole, this is kind of standard, uh, standard stuff, but uh, these applications of, of corrections for uh, reddening and distance and the bolometric correction from what you observe to luminosity, et cetera, all need to be uh, much more carefully done for the very young stars uh, than for much older stars. Um, for main sequence stars, uh, post-main sequence stars, often knowing just a single color and a distance uh, is, is enough, but this is the, the full process. So what we try to do is look at uh, young clusters of different ages. This is, say, a, a million-year-old cluster. This is maybe a 100-million-year-old cluster. And uh, make these HR diagrams, go through that process, and uh, place stars in this plane of luminosity versus effective temperature. And uh, what we see is a sequence. These are uh, so-called empirical isochrones. So the younger clusters are uh, more luminous uh, as, as the stars age. The, uh, uh, same mass star in different cluster becomes less luminous. Uh, but these bars, these vertical bars, are indicative of the luminosity spread that is seen uh, for stars as a function of effective temperature. And this is one of the things we don't quite understand, uh, uh, what causes these spreads in luminosity. And so it makes it somewhat problematic for if we go to an older cluster uh, and look at the, a particular temperature and luminosity or a particular color and magnitude for, say, a field star, how confident can we be in, say, putting that on uh, some isochrones and trying to figure out the age of that star. Even for these clusters, there's some dispersion in, in age that we uh, have not yet fully, uh, fully satisfied ourselves that we understand. Uh, so in addition to uh, luminosity, you might also look at something uh, more fundamental like surface gravity, if you're able to measure that, so gm over r squared. Uh, and this is where the pre-main sequence stars sit in the HR diagram. Again, they're contracting uh, uh, down uh, according to the red tracks. In comparison to main sequence stars, these are from the uh, uh, Valenti and, and Fisher work on uh, atmospheric uh, uh, parameters for planet search stars. These are the main sequence stars and the subgiants. So these are post-main sequence here. So this is just the realm of where these young stars sit in the HR diagram. So through some measurement uh, or assessment of luminosity, uh, possibly gravity as a function of temperature, we hope to try to determine ages for these young stars. So the next uh, thing I want to talk about this, that's roughly uh, uh, model dependent uh, is the depletion of lithium during this pre-main sequence phase. And so this is the same kind of HR diagram now uh, with uh, some schematics showing the internal structural changes that are going on in the star. So low mass stars uh, below uh, the mass of the sun contract roughly in a fully convective manner, whereas stars uh, around the solar mass and above uh, take this turn in the HR diagram towards the main sequence, develop a radiative core, uh, and some stars go through uh, much more structural change than that. But the important thing here is that during this convective phase, the, uh, uh, in particular lithium, which we heard about earlier, uh, can be uh, convected down to a temperature at which it will burn. 
And so uh, the, how one measures, now we're done with two of these pointers. Okay, there we go. Uh, so there's a particular temperature at which lithium burning might take place, and uh, stars, higher mass stars kind of cross this boundary and come back, whereas lower mass objects, low mass stars, brown dwarfs, et cetera, uh, will continue to deplete lithium. And so uh, this is, can be used as a way uh, of getting at the age of the star because it's something a little more fund uh, fundamental than, um, than these isochrome placements. And so this is just an illustration of where this lithium burning occurs uh, as stars uh, contract towards the main sequence. Okay, and uh, in this uh, review paper, this is uh, Protostars and Planet 6, uh, there's a table demonstrating a comparison between the HR diagram and isochrone ages compared to this lithium method. And uh, through you know, some improvements in understanding of both of these uh, uh, over the past decade or so, there's actually you know, not so bad uh, agreement, I think I wrote that there, not so bad, uh, agreement between the ages gotten from these two different techniques tied to, tied to theoretical models. And so this is a much better situation than it used to be. We used to have large offsets between ages inferred from HR diagrams, ages inferred from uh, uh, lithium, for example. And so these, these canonical uh, clusters, and these are important clusters to have age dated because of the empirical techniques that I'm going to talk about next, are all tied to knowing, uh, knowing the ages of these clusters. And so this is like the, the extra galactic distance scale, right? There's some you know, fundamental basis, some lower rungs, and as we get further and further up, we get further from our base. So it's important to understand what the base is. So the base of our age calibrations that I'll talk about next uh, have to do with understanding the ages of these clusters. And so this is reassuring that we're doing not so bad uh, now in the agreement between these techniques. Okay, and then uh, uh, another uh, model dependent but very useful uh, technique is, is uh, astroseismology. Uh, and uh, here, and I'm not going to go through this, but basically, uh, you, you know, uh, RR Lyrae stars, Cepheids, Myras, et cetera, they're large uh, pulsating stars. Uh, stars closer to the main sequence also pulsate because they're smaller. Uh, the pulsation uh, amplitudes are smaller. The time scales are shorter. So in the sun, this is kind of a few minute uh, oscillation period. But if you make a periodogram of either uh, very precise radial velocities or very precise photometry, uh, uh, one can infer uh, what's called this uh, large separation and small separation and make essentially a, a pulsation HR diagram. So these are theoretical tracks here of mass and age. And these are, again, just these uh, quantities derived from measurements of differences in this uh, Fourier space. And uh, one can observe these quantities. And again, Corot has done this kind of work. Kepler has done this kind of work uh, to try to infer uh, ages of stars. It's still model dependent, um, but uh, based on very detailed observations. So we think uh, in the pre-main sequence phase, uh, there's this instability strip. It's the same instability strip that goes up the higher masses, uh, or sorry, larger radii uh, for more evolved stars. It's the same thing, but now we're closer down uh, to the main sequence, which runs this way. So high mass stars cross this instability strip, and uh, there have been a few stars observed with Corot uh, uh, that have had their ages uh, derived from this pulsation technique. And there's also a predicted uh, instability strip as at low masses in the pre-main sequence phase. So these are stars, uh, very low, low mass objects, uh, lo low mass stars and brown dwarfs. They're still contracting uh, towards the main sequence. It's thought they pass through. Uh, here it's an instability caused by deuterium burning, and this is predicted but not yet, not yet observed. So there's some hope that we can get some uh, possibly more fundamental ages through these pulsation techniques. And uh, this is a slide I just uh, grabbed wholeheartedly uh, from someone else just to show, uh, again, il il general illustration of, of uh, ages from seismology, uh, the precision that is derived on, on mass and age, uh, and the location in the HR diagram. So these are uh, mostly post, these are post main sequence stars. Uh, showing essentially where, uh, I believe this is showing where uh, seismic data does exist. It's not all analyzed at this point to my, to my knowledge. But this is essentially where we have, and, and so you can see that there's a dearth of data down at this low mass and, uh, and, and more on the main sequence, right? So the larger stars have higher amplitudes, uh, uh, somewhat longer periods, and so they're easy, it's easier to detect the pulsations. It's harder to detect the pulsations down here on the main sequence. But again, it's a useful technique if we can find a way to apply it. Okay, so we've been through this. I'm going to 
uh, spend uh, the rest of the time going through these empirically derived or empirically based calibrators to stellar age. And again, uh, all of these uh, rely, these are things we can measure, the rotation of a star, measurements of the activity, magnetic activity of a star, uh, empirical measurements of uh, the lithium uh, that I referred to earlier, but again, calibrated to other clusters as opposed to calibrated to um, fundamental theory. Uh, so I'll go through some of these, uh, but again, they rely on our understanding up here, right? This is the base, and in particular, those clusters uh, Alpha Per, Pleiades, these kind of few tens to a few hundred mega year old clusters. Uh, everything uh, that we talk about here is based on knowing, uh, knowing those ages. Okay, so rotation activity in lithium. Um, even our own sun is an active star, our four and a half billion year old sun, and this is showing uh, just compared to the black body, uh, uh, assumed black body spectrum out in the radio, there's uh, extra emission from magnetic activity that varies. Uh, as the sun goes through its 11-year uh, cycle, uh, there's excess out in the ultraviolet and uh, also X-ray emission that, again, you know, all these things vary as the sun goes through its 11-year uh, um, solar cycle. And so we, the younger stars are even more active, and so we can try to use this uh, activity as a proxy. And so the activity, the magnetic activity, is driven by the rotation of the star. And in particular, uh, it's thought to come from the uh, inner uh, radiative core of the star and the outer convective envelope for a solar type star, that at that interface region, uh, uh, this, this dynamo is driven. And it has to do with the rotation and uh, possibly differential rotation uh, of the star. So these are uh, kind of uh, crummy plots that have been copied from presentation to presentation. But basically, what they show is that uh, as Clusters, these are the, each of these points is a different cluster. So as the clusters get older from uh, 10 million years to 100 million years to a billion years to uh, the sun and M67 out here, uh, the rotation declines uh, pretty smoothly as a function of age in the median. Uh, but there's a pretty wide dispersion. And uh, here uh, is a plot that shows now ages on this axis. So 10 million years, 100 million years, a billion years. Uh, this is showing uh, the angular velocity uh, as a function of age, and you can see this very large spread in uh, rotation rates as a function of age that uh, seems to converge uh, after about a billion years or so. Uh, and so uh, in the mean, or sorry, if, I, if we look at the median values, you know, there's this very nice decline, but for any given cluster, and therefore you might infer any given random field star, uh, you know, there can be some, uh, some rage at this rotation rate. Uh, and the basic issue is there's, there's this tail of rapid rotators. Uh, so there's kind of a mean behavior where the stars spin down as they age. Uh, and I think, you know, we all understand that. They, they spin up as they get to the main sequence. They're contracting. The stars spin up due to the solar wind or stellar wind on the main sequence. Uh, they, they spin down just magnetic braking uh, through angular momentum, uh, angular mo momentum loss. Uh, so-called magnetic braking. And so the proportion of stars, this is now period as opposed to velocity. So the rapid rotators are down here. Uh, the slow rotators are, are up top in each of these panels. Uh, as these clusters, uh, as we look at older and older clusters, the proportion of these rapid rotators uh, uh, decreases. And that's what we saw here, uh, 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 too. We kind of have this mean behavior here. Uh, there are these rapid rotators and the the relative ratio of the rapid to slow rotators changes as a function of age in the cluster. Um, and so what has been done is to calibrate, uh, this is, uh, again, period. This is now versus color as opposed to mass. I know we are interchanging temperature and color and mass on these different, different plots. They're not consistent, uh, but I think uh, everyone, everyone can get the picture. Uh, we can try to calibrate, again, using these clusters, what the mean rotation is as a function of age of the cluster and then go apply that to, uh, to our random field star that might have a companion around it that we want to, want to age date. Uh, so this is, this is possibly uh, explaining uh, the rapid rotators, uh, and this is uh, purported to explain the, uh, the mean behavior of stars in these clusters, the slower, the slower rotators. So this is an observational empirical calibration between rotation and age. Um, and so uh, this is a figure uh, from a, a paper from a few years ago, again, kind of illustrating this uh, spread. So here, this is the Pleiades cluster, 
Uh, these are all these mysterious uh, rapid rotators. These are the slower rotators. And if you uh, fit lines to these stars as a function of color and a function of age, um, there are uh, some fits that we think are good to about a 0.1 dex in, in age for uh, the, the, the mean uh, properties of stars in the cluster, the slower, the slower rotators. So that's one age diagnostic. So that's rotation. Uh, then I want to spend a little time on activity. Uh, so this is chromospheric activity. Again, the sun uh, has a chromosphere. Other stars have chromospheres. They are more active. They're more rapidly rotating and more active than the sun. And this is just illustrating one uh, empirical manifestation of that uh, for stars of increasing age from a few tens of millions of years to a few hundred million years. Uh, the uh, emission, and this is the calcium K line at 39, 33 angstroms, there's this emission line uh, in the core of this broad absorption, right? This is just, uh, uh, you know, the, the H and K lines and, and hydrogen are the strongest lines in, uh, in stars, uh, but there's a temperature inversion uh, due to the activity, and so this is hot emission, uh, hot lines coming from the, the chromosphere of the star, so that empirically this decays uh, with time. And there's a calibration uh, that can be derived to try to measure the strength. There's this, this doublet, uh, uh, so-called H and K lines, uh, this uh, doublet trying to measure the strength of this core emission uh, relative, and there's a correction for the color of the star uh, or the temperature of the star. Uh, we uh, quantify this in terms of this uh, uh, notation R prime HK. And so that has also been shown, again, calibrated based on these clusters uh, to be uh, a function of age. So these are the more active stars are over here, but there's 10 to the minus 4 of the bolometric uh, luminosity from the star is coming out in these H and K lines down to uh, these older stars where it's about 10 to the minus 5. And so, again, these are the same clusters that we've been uh, talking about and looking at on these different plots. Uh, uh, the blue line here is from a paper by David Soderblom in 1991, or uh, thereabouts based on three uh, clusters. So that's about right for the older stars. But as we get more active, this deviates from a straight line. Uh, uh, as so, and so the fits here, as opposed to the tenth dex that we derived from the rotation, uh, the, the, the slow rotators, here these fits are good only to about 0.25 dex in age. And for the more active stars, um, the fits are a little bit worse, uh, maybe only uh, you know, an order of magnitude in age. And that's because we haven't accounted for the fact that there's this dispersion among the clusters in the R prime HK. Uh, for the rotation, we were looking only at these slow rotators, the stars that were well behaved, uh, we think, you know, spinning down with age, but there was that uh, rapid rotator tail that I spoke of. Here, there's some dispersion in the calcium H and K emission, probably for the same reason, right? It's driven by the, the range in rotation. And so we haven't separated those here, so this is why, uh, in part, why those error bars are so large, because there is an intrinsic range. And so, again, if you look at some field star uh, that has a companion around it, and you say it's a 100 million year old, uh, or you think it's around 100 million years old, if you try to use this uh, calibration, you measure an R prime HK, um, you know, there's a pretty big dispersion, in, a pretty big error in the age that you're going to derive. But this is, this is what we're stuck doing. When we have these field stars, we have a couple of measurements. We can measure how fast it's rotating. We can measure these activity indicators. And we want to try to use those in these calibrations to say something about the, about the ages. Um, so, Everything I've said so far has really been applied to solar mass stars, uh, and that's because that's where most of the attention uh, has been historically. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of data uh, for low mass stars. These are M-type stars, and you can define an equivalent quantity, so the ratio of the flux in H alpha as opposed to the calcium H and K lines, uh, which has a color uh, or mass dependence here that hasn't, this is just illustrating the data. Uh, no one, to the best of my knowledge, no one is actually derived a calibration uh, for this RH alpha uh, as a function of age. Um, uh, and of course, H alpha is variable, and so that's what's illustrated here, that you know, as is H and K. So all these magnetic activities, that, you know, look at the sun, it has flares, it has uh, rotating spots. You know, these you take one measurement, that's not necessarily a good uh, approximation for the mean behavior of the star. So uh, that's another uncertainty that comes into this. Uh, okay, so. In terms of the chromospheric emission, there's line emission. So I talked about calcium H and K and H alpha. There's also continuum, the UV uh, excess that I showed you earlier in the sun. Uh, there's a, a recent paper out uh, trying to look at relative to the stellar photosphere in the UV, which is falling off. So this is one micron. So the infrared is out here. 
the optical spectrum and the photosphere of the star, something that you would calculate from a stellar atmosphere model, is falling off very rapidly towards the UV. Uh, but empirically, a lot of these young stars have a UV excess. And this is shown here. Uh, and I can't remember. I'm sorry if it's a model or, or uh, data from IUE or something. Uh, it's a model. OK, it looks like a model. Yes, the red is a, is a model of uh, 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 chromospheric emission. And what's shown here are the galax bands, FUV and NUV bands, where this might be, uh, might be measured. So in this paper, uh, what was done was uh, to uh, look as a function of age uh, what the uh, amount of excess in the NUV band and the FUV band uh, was uh, for stars in various clusters as a function of age. And they're showing a relatively uh, flat or little, you know, slight decline over the first few hundred million years, and then a more rapid decline uh, out beyond a billion years. And this is the same kind of calibrations that we saw for uh, H and K uh, and, and, and rotation. There's kind of a, the young stars remain active uh, in a mass dependent way for some tens to hundreds of millions of years. And then around a billion years, whether it's half a billion years or two billion years, there seems to be some turnover, uh, again, mass dependent as to what this actually is. So all these calibrations, I would say all of them uh, are still a little bit crude at the moment, but what they're, what, they're what we have to work with. Um, in, the, in terms of uh, this uh, particular work with ultraviolet, of course, the, uh, in those bands, you're, there's continuum, uh, but there's also line emission that comes in from various species. Obviously, this is uh, Lyman alpha is uh, way uh, out here is Lyman alpha, so it's not in these galax bands but it's a strong uh, UV line. Um, and so some of what we're seeing here is coming uh, from the chromosphere, but some of it is actually coming from the hotter corona as well. Uh, and again, in analogy to the sun, uh, there's, there's uh, X-ray emission that is uh, amped up by several orders of magnitude compared to, uh, compared to the sun and these young stars. So again, there's still, I think, some work to be done in understanding uh, how to calibrate any of these uh, uh, quantities directly to age. We know they're correlated with one another. Uh, there's a paper uh, where we showed the um, H and K index measured from the calcium lines is uh, correlated with the UV excess. And this is a figure I just grabbed from the AppJ uh, article here. Uh, these are uh, different color bins, so redder uh, and bluer stars, showing the fall off um, uh, uh, in. So here, bluer is more active. And uh, a lower number here is more active. Uh, so these are the more active stars. These are the less active stars. Uh, and it's kind of showing this fall off uh, or, and uh, you know, correlation with the H and K. Right? It's not great. There's a lot of scatter uh, from these independent, independent measurements. Um, and then another point is you know, Galax kind of runs. Galax was great. Right? All, nearly all sky, not quite all sky, but uh, tried to fill in some parts of the galactic plane at the end. Uh, but a wide a survey of the sky at ultraviolet wavelengths. We've never had that before, uh, but it does run into some sensitivity limits. And the stars that are bright in the FUV, uh, 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 they're, they're saturated in the FUV and not detected in the NUV, and you know, various combinations thereof. So it's actually hard, even on these very nearby clusters, to get, um, uh, to get consistent data across all of these diagnostics. OK, so the last thing I want to mention is uh, X-ray. Uh, uh, well, maybe not the last thing, but X-ray emission is the other of our you know, rotation activity, lithium. So in activity, I've talked about H and K, H alpha, um, UV excess. Uh, X-ray is coming from the hotter corona as opposed to the chromosphere. Uh, and uh, the, this is uh, showing uh, activity cycles of the sun. So when the sun is uh, faint and then more like a solar minimum, there's a certain uh, structure to the corona. When the sun is active, uh, there's more uh, emission coming from the, the, the poles of the sun. And again, in the young stars, uh, you know, this is our boring old sun here, right? The young stars are, are uh, a thousand times roughly more active than, uh, than the sun. And very recently, um, I thought this was a nice uh, demonstration. This is as a function of observation date, OK? So this is days. Uh, the variation in this H and K index that I referred to, the chromospheric activity and measuring, uh, and this has been done for a few other stars as well, the chromospheric activity cycles on another star other than, than the sun. And in red here are uh, X-ray measurements, so showing that the X-ray on this particular star is also undergoing cyclic variations in the same way that the, the chromospheric diagnostics is, are. So it's just nice to see this uh, demonstrated in, uh, in other stars. Um, 
And just like these other diagnostics, there's been an attempt uh, to use these clusters of stars, again, whose ages we think we might know from lithium or HR diagrams and isochrones, try to use these empirical calibrators uh, as a function, uh, calibrate them as a function of the age of the star. So here's our old sun where this variation, again, is just the real variation of the sun in, in time, right? It has, uh, uh, varies its, its x-ray strength through the cycles, just like it varies its H and K strength. But there is a general, uh, a general decline here, and this is the, uh, uh, basically the maximum uh, ratio of about 10 to the minus 3 or so. So again, uh, there have been some fits uh, to try to uh, enable one to convert from some measurement of an x-ray flux uh, to an age. OK, and then finally, I'll just mention lithium. Again, I talked about it earlier, but this is, again, just showing the empirical uh, decline uh, from very young stars of uh, this lithium 6707 line uh, as a function of age. It uh, decreases in strength, and a particularly useful diagnostic, uh, if you have high enough spectral dispersion, is lithium to this calcium 6717 line. And a good rule of thumb is they're roughly equal at about the age of the Pleiades or so. And for younger stars, the lithium line is, is, is stronger. So this is just the data. Um, and then if you collect this kind of data on uh, uh, clusters of stars over a range of masses uh, and just measure the strength of this lithium line, uh, you see that for the very young clusters here, uh, they have strong lithium and there's a mass dependent uh, depletion of lithium. I showed those theoretical curves much earlier uh, that show how we think this works in theory. This is the uh, empirical data. There's some mass dependent uh, depletion having to do with the convection of lithium down to temperatures where uh, where it's destroyed. And so again, uh, there's you know, empirical relations for lithium, uh, lithium abundance uh, as a function of mass and age that people try to derive. Okay, so here's kind of a summary of just the different techniques. And the only point here is just to illustrate that as a function of age on the ordinate, you know, we try to calibrate these different things I've talked about. So here's um, X-rays, uh, uh, H and K, uh, chromospheric emission, rotation, uh, either V sine I or period. Right, we can observe clusters, observe these, uh, this mean behavior, which again is not only age dependent, but also mass dependent. And the calibrations, uh, people have paid most attention to them for solar type stars. But of course, you, know, you have to be very careful about spreading out, say, from solar type to F type stars or applying some uh, uh, solar age calibration to late K or M stars, right? It just doesn't work. So the calibrations exist over a certain temperature or, or mass range, but not for, not for all stars. So there's more just basic stellar astrophysics that needs to be done uh, you know, before we can observe any old random field star and, uh, uh, and get its age. So here's an assessment of how well I think we can do just uh, for a single star if I apply all these different techniques. Uh, the rotation, the activity, the lithium, you know, and independently for each of these derive an age, what do I get? So this is a rough value for the dispersion, uh, which for these young stars uh, means, you know, errors of 100% in age, okay? That's not great, but it's really all we can do. So that's just a caution to those of you um, doing this sort of thing, to just be aware that the, for these young ages, the, the errors are quite large. And I'll just point to this uh, very nice review paper that Rob Jeffries has, talked, uh, has written that has uh, some of the figures I've taken. Uh, he's tried to do a nice job here as a function of age and mass, trying to tell us where the calibrations are good and, and how good. Uh, so I'll refer you to that paper. And then this is my final slide. Uh, in uh, this other uh, review article, we also tried to break down uh, as a function of age, range, and a function, as a function of mass, what are the techniques that are best applied uh, across this grid? And so you have to go to the paper to decode some of this, but it's a lot of what I've ta been talk to, have talked about. So for the young stars, we have a range of techniques. And you know, the, the thing is uh, trying to determine, you know, determine an age and determine the error bar in the age so that you can look at your faint companion, figure out how massive it is, et cetera. Uh, for older stars, we're really, we, we don't have this, uh, panoply of techniques were really, at these older ages, really just relying on isochrones uh, because these activity levels, again, they kind of plummet after uh, a billion years or so. And so for older stars, so RV planets, Kepler planets, et cetera, uh, you know, it's hard to apply some of these, some of these techniques and we're uh, kind of stuck on isochrones. And as I said earlier, the isochrones uh, are a bit crowded and so there are big uncertainties in the age distributions uh, for, uh, for different kind of stars depending on exactly where they sit in the HR diagram. For younger stars, uh, we have a lot more diagnostics, but the, the calibration uh, still needs some work. 
So I will stop there. I'm way out of time. Thanks. Oh, for the activity, well, I, I don't specifically work on this, but my understanding, and there are others in the room who may be able to answer this better, is that there can be interaction between you know, very close in planets and, and stars. And uh, you know, for one of these transiting planets, I forget which one, there's, you know, I think, some demonstrated correlation. Maybe Katya knows. Uh, there's some correlation of, uh, uh, with the orbit of the planet and the, the activity of the star. And so that's you know, just like you know, we, can't, we can't watch all of these stars through what the equivalent of a solar stellar cycle to try to figure out what their mean activity is, right? We just usually take one measurement or maybe maybe a couple. Um, you know, so that's that's possible. I, I don't think the amplitude of that is enough. It's not worse than any other error that we have in the technique. Yes, the first question was about close in companions influencing uh, influencing the activity in indices. Uh, this question is can distant companions, so stars where you can spatially separate uh, uh, objects, uh, have any help? And so that's only true if the mass of the primary is more massive than a solar mass, roughly, where, again, these calibrations have been, been applied. Um, uh, I know uh, for some of the debris disk stars that have companions, uh, people have looked at trying to uh, either apply some of these techniques uh, in that way, or uh, if they're late type pre-main sequence companions, say an M dwarf or an M, M type object that's still on the pre-main sequence track, uh, there can be an age estimated from that as well. So that can be helpful, um, you know, if you're if you're lucky uh, to have to have that scenario. But it, it it can work. It's no better or worse than what I've talked about here. The variability. Well, for the X-rays, uh, you know, a lot of the X-rays are only caught. You know, I mean, most of, most of the X-ray observations are only caught in the in the in the flare uh, flare state. There again, this is not not my field, but you know, I think there are only a couple of stars where we have quiescent uh, X-ray light curves. Um, and so that's what, you know, that's what we're observing, but of course, that, you know, we're observing that for all stars, and so you know, there's a lot of assumption there. And that's why it's an empirical calibration, right? It's not fundamentally tied to, uh, to anything we understand about, about uh, coronal activity. It's just empirical.